All right, perfect. Dr. Joseph, do we give it two minutes? I'm with yes. Dr. Mohan Isaac to join. He hasn't joined yet. Yeah, let's wait two more minutes. Yes. Is Mohan in India or is he back in Australia? I don't know, sir. I think he is in Australia. I, I also think the same. He's in Australia. So the time gap will be different now. Good evening, Dr. Joseph. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh, he's here. Good. Yeah. yeah. I can see Dr. Alison, I can see Dr. Murthy and Mohan, sir. Welcome, everyone. Uh, has MPA joined? Please unmute yourselves. Yes, perfect. I can see. Okay, may I request everyone to kindly uh, enter your display name instead of your device name? That would be very helpful for us. And also, you, if possible, please do turn on your videos. It's uh, a lot more encouraging for the speaker and good for us to see each other. Dr. Joseph George, we may begin with your permission, yes. sir. Yes. Shall we go ahead? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Perfect. Good evening, everybody. Welcome evening. to the good second evening. annual uh, founder oration, Dr. Joyce Memorial <coughs> Oration 2024. It gives me great privilege to welcome all of you this afternoon and um, especially our chief guest, Dr. Victor Pratil and our chairperson, Dr. Tara Rangaswamy. Um, may we start today's event uh, on uh, the oration topic is the right to mental health. I would like to start the event with a small invocation uh, by the residents of Medical Parcel Association before I hand over the mic uh, to Dr. Joseph George for the official welcome address. MPA, over to you. Please unmute yourselves. Joyce in the Lord, always and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord, always and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Thank you so much, MP. Uh, Dr. Joseph George, our president, may I request you to please welcome the gathering, sir? Thank you, Rohini, for this time. <laughs> distinguished uh, dignitaries and colleagues. At the outset, I would like to welcome all of you to the second Dr. Joy Shiromani Memorial Oration event. Dr. Vikram Patel, Paul Farmer Professor and Chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Sciences, Harvard Medical School, is with us to give us the presentation on the right to mental health. It is my joy to welcome our orator this afternoon. Welcome, sir. Dr. Sara Rang Rangaswamy, the vice, vice chair of SCARF, consented to be the moderator this afternoon. I want to welcome Dr. Tara for this event. Dr. Mohan Isaac just joined and um, he is a distinguished member of the Medical Parcel Association, holding the office of the president for many years. And uh, Dr. Isaac was instrumental in getting uh, Dr. Patel this afternoon. Dr. Mohan, I warmly welcome you to this event. Dr. Ajit Bide, Vice President, 
of MPA has done quite a bit of the, the program initiative along with Dr. Along with um, Rohini Rajiv, who is the coordinator of this event this afternoon. I warmly welcome Dr. Ajit as well as um, Rohini for this event. The other officers of MPA, Ms. Alphonse Kurian, Dibanjana Das are with us. I welcome you, you too. I, we've seen a, a number of, um, you know, our invitations were responded positively. And hence we have counselors, administrators, and the student community present with us this afternoon for this event. And it is my joy to welcome everyone. Finally, but not the least, the staff, the residents, and the family members of MBA. I warmly welcome Mr. Ganeshan of Microlabs. Sir, always used to help us with this facility of our recording. Warmly welcome Mr. Ganeshan to this event. Once again, I welcome everyone and looking forward for your participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph George. Uh, may I call upon our Vice President, Dr. Ajit B. Bide, to please introduce Medical Parcel Association and the reasoning behind the memorial oration. Over to you, Dr. Bide. Thank you. Sir, please unmute yourself. Just a minute, uh, I am mildly technologically challenged, so I'll be with you in just a minute. We can hear you, Ajit. Yeah, I'm waiting for my slides. Rohini, could you switch on my slides, please? Yes, please. A minute, sir. Is presenting the slides. Please give me a second. Slide show, please. Yes, just yes, slides. So we have today the second Dr. Joyce Romani Memorial Oration, the Medical Pastoral Association. Slide. The first Dr. Joyce Romani, previous slide, please. The first oration was delivered by Dr. Norman Sartorius on the 12th of December 2020. Uh, we had had a crisis in uh, Medical Pastoral Association. We can now speak about it that we revived the organization, brought it back to life, and we thought this would be a good way of announcing that MPA is indeed alive and functioning very well. We welcomed all our friends back into the fold of the MPA with this oration. Next, this year we have distinguished Professor Vikram Patel from Harvard speaking to us on the right to mental health as a second oration. So you've been welcomed already twice, Vikram, a welcome from me. This oration is in the name of the one person who was instrumental in getting MPA going, so to say. That is Joyce Kamalini John, Ni John, later Shiromani. This slide was given to us by her daughter, Amita, when we had the first oration in uh, 2020. You can see Dr. Joyce through various ages, and uh, she was indeed instrumental in bringing 
life into rehabilitation in mental health across the country. But MPA was a pioneering organization that owes a lot to her. Dr. Joyce was born in 1929, and she had a very wide travel early in her uh, life. Her father was in the defense accounts, and he was transferred frequently. She accompanied him wherever he went. He was a hobby homeopath who later got a qualification in homeopathy and practiced homeopathy. And uh, she was responsible for dispensing medications on his behalf and sometimes even delivering them to patients. And that sensitized her to becoming a healer herself. Later on, on account of the multiple transfers, she decided, they, the family decided that she should stay put in one place. And that place happened to be Bezoada, where she stayed and uh, did, completed her matriculation. During this time, she was with her aunt, a practicing doctor with her own nursing home. And that sensitized her to the need of patients, to the alleviation of suffering. And that, I think, set the ball rolling for her to become a right. doctor herself. She went on to becoming a medical graduate from the Christian Medical College. And she was an outstanding first female of her batch uh, from the Christian Medical College. Later on, she traveled to, uh, she met in, at Allahabad, the secretary of the local YMCA, who turned out to be the love of her life, Paul Sirovani, later Dr. Paul Sirovani. What's remarkable is that uh, he became a doctor, not a medical doctor, but a doctor much, much later in uh, life. He completed his PhD in economics at the age of 90, which is a truly remarkable feat, lauded. Uh, Rohini, please don't change the slides until I tell you. Uh, and uh, so she met Paul and they decided to get married. It was a marriage blessed by both families. And it was a very, very happy marriage as we have witnessed over the years. They have two children. Uh, Paul passed away fairly recently, a few years after uh, Joyce left us. Uh, they have two children. Uh, Amita, who has been very helpful in giving us a life uh, story, as well as uh, Naveen. Unfortunately, we lost Naveen a year and a half ago, who, who, had, who had volunteered to be a great support to us in terms of getting our stuff digitized. We miss you, Naveen, as much as we miss uh, Joyce and uh, uh, Dr. Paul as well. But I'm very glad that Amita is here with us uh, today. Now, start, getting MPA started, two Js were tremendously responsible for this. Next slide. And you will see both of them in this slide over here. That is Dr. S.S. Jairam and Dr. Joyce. This photograph was taken at our uh, Silver Jubilee 25 plus years ago. And you can see both these wizened but wise people who were guiding forces for the MPA to become what it has over the years. Next slide, please. This is the whole uh, family of uh, Paul and Joyce. You can see them with children and grandchildren. Next slide, please. So to come to the beginnings of the Medical Pastoral Association, the Medical Pastoral Association was inaugurated in 1967 in St. Mark's Parish Hall by the Right Reverend Norman Sargent. Now, Norman Sargent was the second bishop of the CSI, Diocese of Mysore. The association was registered under the Mysore Societies Act, and we'll soon see the registration receipt itself in 1972. During the early years, the association continued to operate from the home of Joyce and Paul Ceremony in St. Mark's campus. A little more about that as we go along. Next. Dr. Benjamin Isaac, a cardiothoracic surgeon and medical superintendent of the CSI hospital in Bangalore, was an active member of the doctor clergy group, as it was then called, at the St. Mark's Cathedral. He was also the founding president of the Medical Pastoral Association. And Benjamin Isaac remained in that position till 1978. Dr. S.S. Jairam, eminent psychiatrist of Bangalore and the first to enter private practice and to practice general hospital psychiatry in Bangalore. Uh, we trained in Canada, the USA, the UK yeah. and India. Uh, was closely associated with the Medical Pastoral Association right from its founding, as I mentioned, and was the vice president from 1973 to 78 and became the president in 78, holding the position till 1983, but remaining active with us many years thereafter. 
The MPA was conceived initially as a doctor clergy group that I mentioned. Dr. Joyce Shiromani took the initiative in starting the MPA uh, as its founding secretary. The association was formed as a secular autonomous body. It is an NGO and remains that way. The first NGO in the field of mental health, a fact of which we are very, very proud. Next. How did this come about? We mentioned that it started from Joyce's house. A girl, 21 years old, called Teresa, who hailed from Kerala, had trained as a nurse in India and then worked as a nurse in the Netherlands. She had a postpartum breakdown. Uh, it, it was then labeled as schizophrenia. And she returned to India because of her illness and was admitted to the NIMHANS for inpatient treatment. It probably was still the AIIMH and not yet the NIMHANS as it is now known. Next. Following the discharge from uh, AIMH, Teresa's parents in Kerala were unable to manage her at home and they actually pleaded with Dr. Joyce to do something for her upkeep and uh, welfare. Dr. Joyce's assistance was sought to find a place for Teresa to recoup. Joyce decided Ooh. when she found no other resource available to take her into her house. And this was the first great act of charity that laid the foundation for what MPA was going to turn out to be. The idea for Halfway Home in Bangalore was mooted by Dr. Joyce Shiromani, and this was the first of its kind in India. Next. The Halfway Home was planned to provide persons discharged from standalone psychiatric centers, a period of stay in a therapeutic environment, in a homely place before returning to their homes. It was felt that such a stay would help them to integrate better with families and place of study. Now, in the Western world, the halfway home concept has caught on quite a bit, but this was a pioneering step for India. Next. What did we have in Bangalore? The state government, as a Bangalore City Corporation, when they were presented the cause of MPA, offered MPA a long, unused burial ground on Pottery Road, which is where we are still housed, in uh, close to the Bangalore East Station, on a 30-year lease for the construction of the halfway home. The halfway home project was widely lauded and attracted donors from across the world, such as the Bread for the World from Germany, the Catholic Group from the Netherlands, Oxfam from Brit Britain, the United Church of uh, Canada, and several donors from India. The first building was put up, uh, that was the office block in 1975, for which the foundation was laid by our chief secretary, the late G.V.K. Rao. Next. Rohini. Now, when the halfway home came into being, four men, all discharged from uh, Nimhans, two with primary alcohol-related problems and the others with chronic mental illness, were admitted to the first constructed building. This building became the administrative block after the completion of the halfway home building. The halfway home was established in 1976, and we had in the first year 18 residents, nine women and nine men. Next. This is how our halfway home looks right now as well. Next. And that is our hostel about which we will soon hear soon. Now this is the registration certificate I was talking to you about. It says very clearly over there, the third day of August, 1972. We observe our anniversary from this particular date. So every August we observe our anniversary uh, the, the MPA is registration date. Next. So we've completed 50 years and we started our Suvarna Jayanti in 2022, 50 years from 1972. And we formed a committee headed by Dr. Mohan Isaac. Dr. Joseph George mentioned about Mohan's role in the MPA. Mohan has been the MPA, if I may say so, in very, very many ways. And he is the one who brought it back to life and saw to it that it was a cohesive body that is going to re-enter the field of mental oh, health, I which it will be deprived due to certain uh, crises that had arisen. During our Golden Jubilee, next, we'd like to reminisce about some of the milestones. In 1988, we had a different kind of uh, uh, facility. We'd call it a quarterway home which was a hostel. There were many people who had mental illness who could not go back home 
who were not as unwell as those who had to be kept in the halfway home, who could go to an educational institution or attend to a job in the city. And a hostel was built for them. In 1993, the Mental Health Information Center was started. And in 1992, the World Federation for Mental Health started observing the World Mental Health Day. The first body they reached out to to observe the World Mental Health Day was the MPA. And from 1993, we've been observing the World Mental Health Day. In 1997, an extended and a longer term care facility was uh, inaugurated. In 1998, a need was felt for daycare for many patients who could be housed in the MPA only during the working hours so that their working parents could uh, get some respite uh, by keeping their wards at our center. The Sahai Suicide Prevention Line, the first in Bangalore, was inaugurated in 2002. And in 2006, uh, the land that had been leased to us was purchased by us with great effort by our former secretary, Dr. Gladys Sumitra, from the Bangalore, Red Bangalore Municipal Corporation. In 2016, we started increasing our reach out to the public with programs for mental health awareness. Our next, next, we'll skip this one for want of time. So during our Golden Jubilee year, we have been observing uh, the Golden Jubilee by monthly lectures, right from February 2022, when Dr. Mohan Isaac set the ball rolling. Every month, usually on the first or the last Saturday of the month, we have a lecture called the Asavarna series, and it has covered a wide theme of wide themes across the country uh, and abroad. The valediction of our Asavarna Jayanti happened in August 2023, but we decided to continue the Asavarna series of lectures. On the occasion of our valediction, 10 outstanding local contributors to community mental health from Bangalore were felicitated. We also have a project to commemorate our Golden Jubilee, which is a long-term residential care now underway. So as we look ahead, I would like to quote this favorite prayer of mine from Reverend Higgins, which says, with gratitude in our hearts for the gift of each new day, looking around and listening now in appreciation of this particular day, we offer a prayer for the grace to live today with poetry of word and gesture. May those we meet in whatever way we feel ennobled. May the intentions we shape be good and loving, spreading an infectious optimism into a blessed future. May this renewal of our hope as one human family take us deeper into why you say in Revelation, look, I made all things new. Next slide. A thing of beauty, said Keats, is a joy forever. For us, a thing of beauty is Joyce forever. Joyce Shiromani, after her stint at uh, Bangalore, where she founded the, helped found the Medical Pastoral Association, along with Dr. R.M. Verma, the director of AIMH and later Nimhans, Dr. S.S. Jairam, and several people from the uh, Church of South India, moved on. She established what is now a highly functioning uh, place in uh, Kolkata, that is the Paripurnata Center. And then after retiring, when Paul and she decided to settle down in Chennai, there was uh, the Banyan Tree, uh, the Banyan, which was an organization already functioning over there. But Joyce, typical of herself, very humbly joined them in their work. And that was the last uh, port of call, so to say, and until uh, Joyce was called away from her earthly being. Dr. Rohini? So the Medical Pastoral Association, our founders had these four principal slogans for us, hope, concern, sharing, and guidance. And we continue to our work keeping these in mind. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And uh, over to you, Rohini. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for the very elaborate and very heartwarming presentation about our founder and how MPA started. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Tara to be ready, but I would like to introduce our chairperson first before I can hand over the dais to her. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tara Rangaswamy. I would like to share a small little slide about her because 
her achievements are so much that I can't remember it offhand. Um, please give me a minute to just uh, share a small presentation about her before she takes over the program. Um, sharing a small, small slide. <clears throat> May I also request our uh, orator and chief guest to uh, be ready so that we are good to go as soon as Dr. Tara is introduced. Right. Are you able to see the screen? No, no, really, not yet. No, no. Sorry. In the interest of time, why don't we skip this introduction? And <laughs> no, no, Tam, it's just but, one. It's hardly no. going to take a minute. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, no, I really mean it. You know, I don't think. No, here we are. It's visible now, right? Dr. Tara Rangaswamy uh, is a psychiatrist by training, the co-founder and vice chairman of Schizophrenia Research Foundation, Chennai. SCARF is a premier center offering treatment and rehabilitation of the mentally ill. Dr. Tara is on the advisory committee of the Director General of the World Health Organization, Geneva, and on the editorial board of several reputed journals, including the Premier Bulletin. Um, she was awarded the Honorary Fellowship of the Royal College of Psychiatrists UK in 2014 and the President's Gold Medal from the Royal College UK in 2012. Dr. Tara is the first Indian to win an award from the Schizophrenia International Research Society for her research in clinical and community psychiatry in 2021. In March 2022, she received the Nari Shakti Puraskar Award from the President of India. It is the highest civilian honor to women in India. She has been the co-opted member of the expert group on Health Science 2020 as a part of G20. This is not a profile I would ever want to uh, miss. Thank you so much for allowing me this uh, moment of honor, ma'am, to introduce you. Uh, may I request you to please take over as the chairperson of today's auditory session. Dr. Tara Rangaswam. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks to MPA for this great honor. It's always nice to be back uh, talking to all of you. Uh, but I had requested Rohini to uh, project the slides of uh, Vikram's profile because I thought it would be overwhelming for me to read, go through line by line, you know, and sentence by sentence. So Indeed. maybe, Alohini, can you just project the slides? So, yes, ma'am. Doing that right away. Yeah. So while we are at it, I would like to uh, talk about uh, Mrs. Joyce Siromani, who I knew very well. Uh, uh, of course, MPA, we always looked up to MPA because uh, we are like 10 years younger than, uh, when I say we, I mean SCARF, 10 years younger than MPA. And uh, while you are staring at Vikram's photograph, let me finish. And uh, so uh, Joyce has, uh, we have met many times, uh, Joyce has uh, visited SCARF more than once. And uh, I think I've told you the story before as to how I requested her to uh, spend a day and a night in one of her residential centers and to give me a feedback of what is really happening. And she most willingly and graciously did that. And I got some terrific feedback uh, from her. And uh, I think she, is, she had this very quiet, uh, dignity and grace that uh, we don't see now very often in many people. And uh, I have been always a great admirer of uh, Joy ceremony. Yes, now here, here is Vikram. Ma'am, shall I stop sharing? Yeah. So now that you have seen it all, uh, I just thought I'll tell you something uh, personal about Vikram. Vikram and I go back a long way. From the time he was a young man, not that he's very old now, his hair <laughs> not withstanding, uh, but when he was young and he was toying with the idea of moving away or not really moving away, having one leg in India and one leg in the UK, you know, so to say. 
and uh, he was contemplating moving to India and he asked me, is life with an NGO really worthwhile? You know, and I think we have come a long way then, uh, Vikram, and uh, I, I know, I'm sure you find it worthwhile, just like all of us in SCARF and MPA also find it worthwhile. Uh, and uh, he's a great orator, as you will soon find, find out for yourself. He's a very incisive writer. Uh, a lot of kids all around the world have go, gone gaga over him and said, he's a great mentor, teacher, PhD supervisor, and so on. And uh, in fact, what has really, as an Indian, while I have been traveling, what has really made me very happy and proud is the fact that everybody had something nice to say about Vikram. Everybody had something good to say about Vikram. That, is, that does not happen very often, as we know. And that has always made me extremely happy. And uh, finally, uh, he has a great sense of humor, which probably uh, you will find more in the evenings, maybe after a glass of wine. Uh, uh, he's great company, uh, I can assure you that. And uh, so, I mean, I, I won't, uh, uh, this is all, this is all the personal uh, side of Vikram, which does not appear in any Wikipedia or anything like that. So I thought I should uh, share that with you. And uh, next, next Saturday, the same time, he, he will be with us for the 40th anniversary of SCARF giving another oration. So that is, uh, we are happy to uh, have him with us then. So now over to you, Vikram. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Tara. You you bring a big smile to my face with those memories. And I can also uh, probably when the time comes, I can also share some wonderful uh, ditties about my experiences about you. But for now, let me turn to my oration, The Right to Mental Health. Can I just start by thanking and acknowledging uh, the organizing committee and particularly uh, Mohan Isaac, who has been a great mentor and inspiration for so many of us who have been committed to community psychiatry over the last 30 years. It's truly an honor to deliver the second Joy Ceremony Memorial Oration. I'm also very pleased to see in the participants stalwarts of community psychiatry, many people whose work I have admired and many of whom I would call friends. So thank you all for joining today. My oration today really is borrowed quite heavily, in fact, from a art of medicine piece that I wrote in the Lancet last October, uh, which I can share with you after this presentation. And it was really a piece uh, commemorating last year's World Mental Health Day. I think all of you will remember that that day celebrated meant the theme of mental health as a universal human right. This was a theme that had been chosen through a vote of the members and supporters of the World Federation for Mental Health. Now, the theme has a message that none of us can ever dispute. In fact, I would argue that almost no one can dispute this idea, this theme. But at the same time, it seemed to me that the meaning of mental health as a universal human right, and that is an apostrophe, it felt ideologically loaded. And it seemed to me that it had likely very different interpretations for different audiences. One interpretation, which was elaborated by the Secretary General of the World Federation for Mental Health, emphasized the human right challenges faced by people living with a mental health condition. In their words, these individuals experience disproportionately higher rates of poor physical health, reduced life expectancy, poor access to quality care, and the full range of services for their mental health condition. They also experience discrimination, harmful stereotypes and stigma in the community, family, schools, and the workplace. These are, of course, extremely well-recognized rights universally, but to be sure, they are far from being realized in any country, in any context globally. However, this interpretation of the right to mental health really conflates mental health with mental disorder. For example, if you consider the definition of mental health coined by the World Health Organization, it looks very different. The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of mental well-being that enables people to cope with the stresses of life, to realize their abilities, to learn well and work well, and to contribute to their community. This is much more 
than a mental health condition. Indeed, the World Health Organization goes on to, in fact, emphasize in its words that mental health is more than the absence of mental disorders. It exists on a complex continuum, which is experienced differently from one person to the next, with varying degrees of difficulty and distress and potentially very different social and clinical outcomes. So what exactly does the right to mental health actually refer to? Even if we assume that the question of rights is one which specifically concerns people who are living with a mental health condition like schizophrenia, I would argue there still remains some doubt about exactly what constitutes services. This, in my mind, is not a settled question. So today in my oration, I take this opportunity to expand on these two critical matters, the right to mental health and the right to a mental health service which for me are the essential ingredients of the conceptualization of mental health as a universal human right. Let me, let me start with the first question, the right to mental health. And I wanna begin with the publication of the World Mental Health Report. This is a report that was published in 1995. It were, its editors include, in fact, uh, members of my department that I now chair, including Arthur Kleinman and Byron Good, both of whom are medical anthropologists. This report was a landmark occasion, historic occasion in the evolution of the field of global mental health. And the reason I call it historical is because it was the first coherent articulation of mental health, not as a narrow biomedical construct that was focused on disorders, but as a much broader development issue, which affected the entire population, all of us through a range of historical, social, cultural, and economic forces. At the heart of this reframing, in fact, is the question of rights. In particular, and I want to emphasize this point, in particular, the right to be protected from the known harms to mental health. These harms, friends, are directly or indirectly the result of policies which have governed how the world and how individual countries like India have managed their societies, in particular, but not only through their economic policies. These policies have led to, they have amplified, and they have sustained diverse forms of structural violence, a subject that my predecessor, the late Paul Farmer, wrote so eloquently about in the context of poverty and HIV in Haiti different forms of structural violence, which in turn are critical drivers of mental health. These drivers are in fact the reason why a vast body of research from epidemiology and the social sciences conducted in many different contexts, including by many of us in this room today in India, this is why there is a strong association of poor mental health in all its forms with poverty, with inequality, with violence of all kinds, and in particular, the violence which is experienced disproportionately by historically marginalized groups, which in India, there are many such groups. Of course, women are right at the top of that list, but also you could add the Dalits, the tribes of India, sexual minorities, and in modern India, or today's India, I should say, the growing discrimination against religious minorities. Another strong association is between mental health and displacement, for example, as a result of conflict or climate change. Friends, I'd argue that it is not possible to act upon the idea or the goal of mental health as a universal human right without squarely acknowledging the fact that the policies which have contributed to these powerful forces of structural violence are intentional, they're not accidental. They're intentional, they're ideologically motivated. And it is these ideologies which must be resisted and must be confronted if we truly champion the idea of mental health as a universal human right. After all, how can we embrace a rights-based approach to the mental health of sexual minorities without confronting the religiously motivated hate 
which criminalizes same-sex relationship and directly contributes to the much higher rates of depression, suicide, and substance use problems in these communities? Or how can we address the catastrophic crisis of opiate addiction and mortality, which in the US today has become the leading cause of death in young Americans, so catastrophic is the opiate crisis in the US that life expectancy has actually started falling for the first time in modern history in the richest country in the world because of the pandemic of opiate addiction. How can we address this without confronting the medical industrial complex which lies at its heart? Or how can we wax lyrical about the mental health concerns of refugees from climate disasters of conflict without simultaneously targeting our rage towards the military industrial complex's role in fueling war, consider the terrible catastrophe in Gaza, the fossil fuel industry's role in fueling climate change around the world, and the immigration policies of the very countries which have profited the most from these economic policies and then shut out those people who are fleeing them. Moreover, the right to mental health must also embrace the compelling scientific evidence that comes from the field of developmental science, which demonstrates very clearly that adversities in the first two decades of life, particularly the first thousand or 2000 days of life, that is to say from birth to the age of three or four, much of these adversities occur in the context of structural violence, such as poverty and displacement. These are the most important predictors of poor mental health across the life force. Let me elaborate this point. If there is one risk factor for poor mental health, and by poor mental health, I mean the whole range of mental health conditions from mood and anxiety problems, to self-harm, to personality issues, to substance use, and even psychoses. If there's one risk factor that's been shown consistently in every context, it is adversities in early childhood. We now even have a very rich understanding of the biological mechanisms through which these environmental adversities or social adversities disrupt neurodevelopmental mechanisms in childhood and adolescence. We also have a very rich evidence base on the importance and effectiveness of nurturing environments at home, in schools, and in neighborhoods to promote healthy brain development. To my students, I often say this, Adversities in early life are the closest thing we have in the field of mental health to what tobacco is for cardiac and pulmonary health. Let me repeat that. In a field where we often think we have no targets for primary prevention, in the same way that cardiologists or people working in lung health might target smoking, I would argue we have missed the evidence that clearly shows that providing nurturing environments to children and adolescents is the equivalent to primary prevention in the field of mental health. At the very least then, protecting children and adolescents from the harms that we know can affect mental health across their life course must be a priority for every country. So to close the first part or the first issue that I wanted to address uh, in this conversation, about the right to mental health, I would argue that if we take mental health from an inclusive, broad conceptualization, such as proposed by the World Health Organization, we must work to primary prevention that addresses the known harms and the structural forces that adversely affect our mental health, especially during our earliest years. Let me now turn to the second issue, which is really what the World Federation for Mental Health really focused on when it chose the theme for last year's World Mental Health Day. And the second issue is on the question of what constitutes mental health services. Now, for many people, automatically, the first thing that comes to their mind when we talk about mental health services is the notion that this is a hospital that this is a hospital that is staffed by psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses and other mental health professionals. However, this isn't the way people with mental health problems 
view mental health services. And it's not surprising why there may be this discord. For there is no escaping the historical reality that a significant amount of the human rights abuses towards mental health persons with mental health conditions have taken place not in the community. They have taken place within these healthcare settings, within the hospitals and services under the watch of the profession of psychiatry of which I am a member. For the better part of a century, coercion, involuntary sedation, incarceration, and other forms of violence have been the hallmark of the experience of people with severe mental health problems and disabilities in what we might call hospitals in apostrophes. Because in no other kind of hospital do these experiences occur for people with other forms of, mental, of health conditions. This routine violence is actually obscured by even more horrific forms of violence against people with severe mental health problems and disabilities, often with the collusion of mental health practitioners. Some years ago, I, I, I encountered an exhibition at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, which was dedicated to exposing the collusion of the medical profession with the Holocaust. And I was horrified to find that the most dominant medical profession that was actually colluding with Nazism was in fact psychiatry. And it did so in two very different ways. I don't know how many people were aware until this exhibition brought it to our notice that the first people who were sent to the gas chambers almost as an experiment before Jewish people were sent there in their millions, the first people on whom these gas chambers were tested were people with severe mental health problems and disabilities. And where did they find them? They found them in the hospitals in which they were housed. And who helped bring them onto the buses that took them to these gas chambers? Psychiatrists and psychiatric nurses who told them that they were going on a day picnic. It gave me goose flesh when I saw the photographs of all these individuals with mental illness smiling in front of a bus with their nurses and doctors on either side of them also smiling and knowing fully well what they were about to do. You can imagine how demoralizing that experience must have been for a psychiatrist to see in 2020. Another way in which psychiatry colluded uh, with Nazism and indeed racism more generally is in its leadership role in the evolution of the field of eugenics. How many people are aware that the field of eugenics was actually launched through a study of how the idea that human groups were different species or races? This in fact comes from the field of psychology in particular, the founder of apartheid, Henrik Verwood. Henrik Verwood in South Africa was the chair of the Department of Psychology in the University of Stellenbosch. The development of the field of eugenics, which was used to justify racism and segregation around the world for, for decades, owes its origins to a large part to the false use of scientific arguments that came from the fields of psychiatry and psychology. And then there are many other examples, the forced sterilization of people with mental health problems, particularly young women, the deployment of monstrous surgical procedures like lobotomies on people with mental health problems, and the oppression of political dissidents in the Soviet Union are just more examples of the, of the very sorry and terrible history of the experience of psychiatric services by people with mental health problems. In India, of course, we are no exception. Many of us, not least Professor Mohan Isaac, will remember the landmark report that he himself was at the center of publishing in 1999, spurred on by the National Human Rights Commission, documenting the state of care for people who living with mental illness in India's 40 odd mental hospitals. By the way, this report was triggered not by psychiatrists, it was triggered by civil society activists. In fact, many psychiatrists at that time were very upset that there was a human rights commission inquiry into the conditions of care 
in India's mental hospitals. And I must be very grateful to my colleagues in NIMHANS who actually led this process of inspection, documentation, and publication. Most of these hospitals had been built in the colonial period as custodial institutions. And what this report documented how, was how they had be become essentially warehouses of unwanted human beings, warehouses of people with serious mental illness who had been abandoned by their families and by society, and where conditions of care were primitive at best, probably unchanged since independence, and characterized by the stripping, literal stripping, of the dignity and violation of the basic human rights of those individuals. In the light of this history, it is no surprise that psychiatry and mental health conditions are so heavily stigmatized and feared. Friends, some people argue, especially for my profession, they argue that the reason why stigma occurs uh, in our communities is because of misinformation about mental illness. In my view, that is a wrong interpretation. In my view, in fact, people respond to mental health problems not because they are ill-informed, but in fact, exactly the opposite, because they are accurately informed through their actual historical experiences, if not their personal experiences, then the experiences of others in their communities. Addressing the right to care then must seek to radically reform mental health services and look well beyond orthodox models of mental health care that have vested too much power and too much of the resources for mental health care in the medical industrial complex by making mental health care person-centered and accountable. Let me round up my talk by imagining how we might achieve this goal. And here I wanna draw into my own personal history long time ago when I first met Mohan Isaac, actually. Uh, this was when I was a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe in the Department of Psychiatry back in 1993, and Mohan had visited Zimbabwe uh, as a um, WHO uh, a consultant. And um, I remember very well my, my dinner with, uh, with Mohan. I was so honored to be having dinner with him. Uh, and I remember him, of course, giving me advice about my, my desire to return to India, very similar conversations to the one that Dr. Tara remembers that I had with her. But what I want to recall was that this was the time when HIV, the epidemic of HIV was sweep sweeping through Southern Africa, including in Zimbabwe. In my psychiatric unit in Harare, where I used to work as a psychiatrist, every single week we would have three to five deaths. Can you imagine three to five people dying in a psychiatric unit every week? And all these deaths were because of HIV. So I witnessed from very close quarters the devastating impact of the epidemic of HIV. This was also a disease which sheds very many features with mental illness. It shared features of stigma, of shame, of fear, and also of violence against people with HIV. This was a time when people with HIV were so feared that they would often be locked up in jails. In fact, I remember when I returned to India to Goa, uh, one of the landmark cases around human rights and HIV uh, involved uh, Dominic D'Souza, who uh, was put into a jail cell when he was detected to be HIV positive in Goa because people thought that HIV could be transmitted through touch. But what I really wanna to touch upon in this experience was I witnessed the gut-wrenching inequity in access to life-saving antiretroviral treatments, which by then were already transforming HIV into a chronic condition, but only if you were a white person living in a wealthy country. These very same life-saving treatments was systematically denied to brown and black people and to all people in the global south on a range of spurious, politically motivated arguments, including those emanating, sad to say, from distorted interpretations from the field of public health, particularly the idea of cost effectiveness. Again, a discipline I myself have embraced uh, and which I belong to. I watched with profound humility how despite the science that already existed, the majority of people with HIV were dying around the world because of unjust and unfair structural forces. But I also watched with great humility how people living with HIV were leading the charge to expose the fundamental injustice in this arrangement. And in so doing, contributed 
the most impactful counter arguments for a rights-based approach to medicine and healthcare. And indeed, historians often describe this movement as the most central historical event that led to the emergence of the field of global health, which at its heart puts health equity or justice as its principal goal. Their unrelenting sacrifice and resistance to powerful political and ideological headwinds led to the enshrining of the right to care and the right to dignity and the right to freedom from discrimination as the moral foundation of the global AIDS response. And of course, today you can see how in every part of the world, including in our country, people living with HIV live a life without fear and live a life with complete access to all the interventions, community-focused interventions that we know can keep them alive for as long as anyone without HIV. Now, there are obvious parallels between that crusade and what needs to be done in global mental health. And at the heart of that is centering the voices of persons with the lived experience of mental health problems and empowering, empowering them with appropriate services, resources, and skills to ensuring a rights-based approach to mental health care, something that I know Dr. Tara uh, and her organization and her colleagues are very, very uh, uh, proud of and which ha who have embraced in their own work. And many of you have done as well as, of course, not least the MPA. The concerted advocacy by movements of persons with the lived experience who have exposed the sorry history of human rights abuses perpetrated under the guise of mental health care has been instrumental in leading to the acknowledgement of these rights in the UN's Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And this convention, of course, to which India is a signatory, has ultimately led to the landmark Mental Health Care Act in our country, which in my mind is one of the most progressive mental health care legislations in any country around the world. In fact, it's become almost a, a case study for many countries that are seeking to reform their mental health care legislations. Relatedly, the right to care must also offer care which is desired by persons with a lived experience. In other words, we must offer care to address what matters to them, the hallmark of person-centered care. Oftentimes, this is not directed at the symptoms of mental health problems which dominate the biomedical discourse. It's not oftentimes the hallucinations or the loss of interest that dominates the suffering that people with mental health problems experience. But it is often the social determinants which are associated with mental health problems from poor housing, income insecurity, lack of work, and perhaps most importantly, a lack of purpose in life and social isolation. Friends, the most transformative innovations in global mental health have focused on this aspect of delivering care that people need. And it does so by leveraging resources that every community possesses, people who care for others. These interventions, typically provided by people in the community, such as community health workers, peer support workers, nurses, and lay people, deliver interventions in settings in the community. For example, in my own work, in a person's own home. And these typically attend to their psychological and social needs. This substantial body of implementation science, now more than 100 randomized controlled trials, including many from India, has been embraced by nearly every major stakeholder in global mental health, including the WHO, the World Bank, and many national governments. The critical question today then is no longer whether such community-focused, community-delivered, and community-owned mental health care is effective. The question isn't whether it's effective because that's been proven again and again, but how such interventions can be scaled up in a way which ensures that all people with mental health conditions in every community not only get the care that they need, but also when and where they need it and with assured quality. This is a major emphasis of my own ongoing work, in particular through 
the Empower program, which is deploying digital methods and tools to build the capacity of a frontline workforce to deliver evidence-based psychosocial interventions. For example, in the state of Madhya Pradesh, we are working in close partnership with the state government to scale up an integrated intervention for mothers with mental health problems and providing nurturing care environments to promote early child development in eight districts of the state through the network of ASHAs and Anganwadi workers in those eight districts. I want to end by just remarking on how much these ideas are completely in sync with Dr. Joyce Shiromoni's own inspirational story. As we already heard from Dr. Bide, Dr. Shiromoni was a physician whose early exposure to mental illness was only during her medical student years, which even today, sadly to say, comprises just a few weeks during the MBBS years, most often in a psychiatric unit. She really had a transformation when she became a sort of foster mother to Teresa. Because Teresa, if you remember, an Indian nurse was working in the Netherlands when she, at the age of 21, had to be repatriated to Bangalore to Nimhans when she had an acute psychotic illness. Joyce and her husband took Teresa into their own home. They gave her shelter. And perhaps most importantly, they gave her love to support her recovery journey. Thus began Dr. Siromoni's own personal journey of discovery of the fundamental humanity of people with mental illness and the need for shelter and love as essential ingredients of recovery. Ultimately, of course, culminating in the founding of Medical Pastoral Association's first halfway home in India in, 19, in the early 1970s. Dr. Siromoni's <laughs> lifelong commitment to this cause led her to describe three key personal lessons, which I believe are foundational themes for the right to mental health. And I want to quote directly from her writings, these three lessons. My close interaction with the mentally ill has taught me many lessons, that they are human beings first and then patients. My second lesson was that a mentally ill person's dignity and respect could be lost in most government hospitals where he or she is a non-entity. A person's self-dignity has to be safeguarded and restored. And my third learning was that when one assumes a purely professional role while relating to a mentally ill person, one tends to deal with him or her as a case rather than as a person. In closing, the realization of mental health as a human right, as a universal human right, is a lofty goal. It's a goal that we can all agree with. But it is a goal which will then require us to take a hard look at the structural forces which harm mental health and which vest unlimited power to a narrowly defined, disorder-focused biomedical paradigm in the care delivery architecture. The universal right to mental health must always be embedded in the right to be protected to the known harms to mental health, and at the same time, to the right to agency, to freedom, to inclusion, and to dignity in mental health care. To do so, friends, we will have to address the neoliberal economic policies which have dominated global discourse for centuries, and which have directly led to and justified the devastation of vulnerable populations and of our environment, and which have fueled the medical industrial complex. We cannot achieve the universal right to mental health without calling out and confronting these policies. And as with any human rights discourse, we must acknowledge that both of these areas of mental health and the policies that harm them are fundamentally a political choice. They're fundamentally an intentional action and that all of us who champion last year's World Mental Health Day theme will need to work in solidarity with each other to force our governments to take the necessary actions to secure these rights for our communities. Thank you all for a patient listening. Uh, I believe that in oration, generally there are no questions, but I'll be more than happy if the organizers wish for me to take questions from all of you. Thank you all for your patient listening and let me hand back to Dr. Tara.
Oh, thanks, Vikram. That was a very passionate and uh, it's a very scientific discourse. And I'm sure many of us, especially my fears, uh, it stirred up a lot of emotion because we remember the cases of abuse that we have seen, you know, very personally. And uh, we have remained helpless about uh, many, many things. And just to tell you an example, in the hospital where I worked as a student, my first exposure was when I was early morning walking along the female ward, I found two women totally disheveled and they, they didn't have their clothes on them. And when I inquired, I was told that the two policemen from the police post outside, rather within the campus of the hospital, they make their nightly round, night rounds there. And uh, I mean, they carry out their own affairs. When I wanted to complain about this to the uh, police officials, to the top administration, the hospital administration was not for it. And, you know, I mean, I think that was, that, that was the first huge blow I received as a woman and as a human being. You know, that I'm unable to do anything for these women who are so helpless and who have no voice. I mean, I'm sure like uh, Mohan and Ajit, all of us would have had similar experiences. Uh, maybe things are getting better. Uh, yeah. Hopefully it should, uh, you know, um, get better as... Uh, as we go on, I would now invite questions from anybody. If, if I may, Dr. Thara, if I may, uh, you know, actually specifically ask uh, Dr. Mohan to, to tell us about, you know, I've always wondered, Mohan, uh, what courage and uh, did it take to do that uh, report? Because you were, in fact, in writing that report, taking on the establishment that you were a member of. Uh, and I wondered what your experience was. I've never asked you that question, but here is a moment for me to ask you that question. Uh, Tara, can I, can I go ahead? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a long time ago. It was during the 90s that uh, the National Human Rights Commission report, uh, you know, the work uh, for preparing that report uh, which involved a lot of our colleagues, uh, you know, Murali, Matthew, Pratima, Kiran Rao, many of us, we formed into as teams and went to all the mental hospitals in the country. I think what was most important at the time was, uh, you know, the um, uh, Mr. Justice Venkata Chalaya uh, had retired as a Supreme Court judge. He was also the chairman of the National Human Rights Commission. And after his retirement, one of the former chief justices of Karnataka, Mr. Justice Malimat, who was a personal friend of Dr. Chennabaswana, uh, you know, he had taken over as the chair of the National Human Rights Commission. So Dr. Chennabaswana uh, also had retired. And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he, he thought that it was too early for him to retire from active work. And he used to discuss with us what can be done. And uh, this was an idea that many of us had, that lots of things are going on in mental hospitals. As you rightly said, and as Tara said, none of us are able to do anything. Maybe the Indian Psychiatric Society and the psychiatric bodies will not be able to do anything. So we sort of initiated, I mean, just as Malimath was very, very receptive, I still remember going with Dr. Chandrasona to Justice Malimat's house in Bangalore. He used his official house was in Delhi as the chair of the National Human Rights Commission. But he would come every month for a few days. We went and told him, uh, you know, about all this. And uh, we also conveyed to him that this can be done only if the National Human Rights Commission does it as their own project. So it was all worked out and it was an NHRC project they gave the funding for the whole uh, visits and all that and uh, you know it was with the order of the national human rights commission i don't think otherwise we could have uh, as a faculty of the man's gone to any mental hospitals and had this kind of an inquiry i mean how many people are there how many beds are there what kind of food is being given where is the uh, food cooked who are the people who cook a number of things i mean you know the report so that's how the National Human Rights Commission report came. Uh, it took nearly two, uh, two years. And uh, one of the persons, the people who wrote the first draft were uh, Kiran Rao and Pratima, Pratima, who is now the 
director of National Institute of Mental Health, but we used to have regular meetings. Uh, of course, we knew that it has the potential to cause a lot of problem. So we had to be very balanced in the report. We had to convey the facts. I mean, the kind of things which Tara mentioned. Uh, Tara mentioned about two cases in her hospital, but the bigger scandal was in Trivandrum Mental Hospital, where the wall adjacent right. to the Trivandrum Mental Hospital, women's ward was the wall of the Central uh, Reserve Police in Austin. They used to jump over to the uh, female ward every night, almost on a regular basis. I mean, lots of stories. I mean, the NHRC report doesn't give all the stories, but some of the stories so that, you know, it is still uh, with the Supreme Court and the NHRC is now looking after some of the hospitals under some kind of a monitoring agency, etc. And lots of things have improved. I must also say that I kept a personal interest in knowing what has happened. What has happened is that a lot of money was available. Okay, they said, oh, the funding is not there and that's why these mental hospitals are all archaic. Now, money is something which all superintendents, administration at the state level are all happy because they can spend. So lots of structural changes are I mean, the old floorings uh, were changed to mosaic flooring, the toilets were repaired, etc. But did it result in adequate functional changes? That I'm still doubtful. In fact, Pratima is still waiting yeah. on the one of the members of the National Human Rights Commission's monitoring team. Frequently reports come about. So the point I'm making is structural changes are easy. Functional changes and changing the culture of the hospital is good. And uh, having now worked for the last few years in a country where the institutionalization began earlier, I think the mindset and the culture of the institutional mindset is very difficult to go. So this is very briefly become uh, the story behind the NHRC. Subsequently, 20 years later, uh, after I retired, again, a, a smaller team went to many of the institutions to see what kind of changes have occurred. In fact, that has also come in a book form. Uh, if you carefully go through, you will find that, uh, uh, you know, in reality, not many changes have occurred. And even now, uh, uh, frequently, newspaper reports come in Indian newspapers about mental hospitals. Back to you, Tara, as the chair. Yeah, thanks, Mohan. That was, I mean, of course, we had known most of it. At least our generation, we knew most of these things, you know. Uh, Nirmala, I see your hand up. A brief question. Hello, Tara. My question is already there in the chat box. Do you can you yeah. pull it out? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, I can yeah. see it. So thank you, uh, uh, Nirmala. I hope I have phrased it properly. Yes, yes, excellent. We experienced yeah. it. We families experienced it, Tara, during the COVID. Yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, uh, you know, Nirmala, you really do. I, I use the use the word vulgarization of mental health. It's an interesting uh, a use of words. I have not heard that before, but I, I, I think I understand what you mean, which is that suddenly mental health became the second most talked about health issue during the pandemic. Uh, the first one was, of course, the, 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 uh, the, the virus itself. Um, and if you look at the conversation, there was all about people like us who were experiencing some anxiety and some fear because, you know, we didn't know whether the virus would come to our doorstep and whether yeah. or not, you know, we would, uh, you know, and, and so we had medicalized what was actually a completely normal experience in the face of what was a catastrophe, such as one that we had never experienced before and completely forgot that the group most vulnerable to the pandemic lockdown and, and especially the cessation of services, uh, healthcare services, were people with serious mental illness. And, and actually, you know, many of you who are psychiatrists will remember that, you know, there was this whole, uh, when the vaccines were being rolled out, there was this whole priority that were being given in the early days of the rollout to people with chronic diseases, because the idea was that, you know, people with, uh, let's say, diabetes, for example, were much more likely to suffer a, a, a worse episode of COVID when infected. Actually, people with serious mental illness were the most vulnerable of all. If you look at the mortality data that has come out now, you will find that the more standardized mortality ratio, that is to say the excess risk of dying when you had COVID, was highest for people with schizophrenia, 
followed for people with yeah. substance use conditions. It was the highest. It was more than diabetes. It was more than cancer. And I kind of, I, I look back at all the policies to look at the priorities that were given for the vaccination. And I never saw people with serious mental illness in that list. And it struck me that there was another example here of discrimination and injustice, that, that the most vulnerable group of people had their services not even discussed, nor were they in fact prioritized when the vaccine was available. So thank you for raising this issue. You're absolutely correct. We let down people with serious mental Vikram, illness. It would, be of interest, Vikram, it would be of interest to know that MR lobby have managed to get access to vaccination as category, a category along with health workers. We have not been successful. How can you all help us? How can you as professionals please tell us how you can help us? We have not been successful to get access to vaccination on priority, though as you rightly said, the core it's really a terrible situation. We are all very scared on this. Yeah. Well, certainly I would say, Nirmala, you know, this particular pandemic is now probably behind us. But, you know, certainly yeah. I would argue that the, the next time one comes, it's not if, it but it's really a question totally. of when. Yeah. Uh, I feel that our profession must be out in the front to demand uh, yes. from the experience of COVID that people with serious mental illness must have their healthcare services uninterrupted, importantly, number one. And number two, they should be treated as the highest uh, 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 priority group when a, a effective intervention or prevention is available. We couldn't get medicines in lockdown. Uh, can we go on to the next? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, thanks, Nirmala. Yeah. So, ma'am, may I ask another question? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, actually, in the can you introduce beginning, yourself very briefly? Yeah, it it will be brief only. So, um, okay, me. Uh, my name is Sunita, and I'm on this group because uh, I have a daughter, uh, who's going through some uh, mental health issues, and I'm a single parent with my son also, and he has also has uh, some issues like substance abuse and all because of their traumatic childhood which I could really you know uh, connect to when um, uh, uh, Mr. Vikram Patel mentioned about how the first few formative years and the trauma and the, uh, the toddlerhood or the childhood experience later on I mean how they come out in children it was like something as if it was my story now, my question here is, uh, like it was mentioned, some quarter way home uh, for people who are not basically for halfway homes uh, or who are more independent and more uh, on their own, but some supervision is needed. Is there anything like that, uh, quarter way homes or hostels in India? I would like to know uh, I that. Would, I invite someone from MPA to respond yeah, to that. Sunita, um, I suggest this This really uh, is an important question, but it's not relevant to the duration, I think. Am I right, Vikram? Well, but yeah, it, it's but uh, since it's an we, MPA we, we, thing, we, we, and we, it was we, part we, of the we, MPA presentation, just, just sir. Just a minute. Just a minute. We have our website. If you just uh, Google Medico Personal Association, you can post your query to us. We will get back to you within a week. Not now. Right now, it's. I think we are concentrating on the oration. It happens yeah, to but be the MPA. At side. least, yes or no, is there? Can I I'll, just I'll, know I'll, that? I'd like to know your. Uh, I'd like to know a little more about your situation, and we'll definitely get back to you. Okay, thank you. And uh, it's uh, to uh, Sir Vikram Patel. Like a lot of his things were really uh, helpful to the uh, PMIs. What in India? Because I think, as it was told, his legs are one foot in India and the other in UK as he meant uh, that was mentioned that he's he's the one who travels a lot to UK and India uh, as Man Thara has mentioned long back so is uh, what is there anything better for um, rehab or anything in UK who is some a person who is mildly affected with mental illness, my question to him. 
So, uh, you know, actually, yes, I used to be uh, working uh, in the UK and India for many years, but now I work in the US. The US has probably a great example of how a narrow biomedically dominated mental health care system is not the solution. I, I work now and live in a country that spends more on mental health care than any other country per capita, has more psychiatrists and psychologists than you can ever imagine. Uh, and yet more people with schizophrenia tonight will sleep in a prison then they will sleep in their own homes. And it is a shocking and disturbing statistic for the American Psychiatric Association. So, but it, for me, it's evidence that just having more of us, people like us, is not the only answer. We, of course, we need people like us, but we cannot see us as being the, um, by us, I mean, the professional uh, medical community as the sole uh, uh, provider of care uh, or the kind of care. But the UK was different. I will say this, uh, having trained in psychiatry in London, uh, and having then worked in the initial years before I came back to India as a clinician, I, I have to say it was the most uh, inclusive and more community oriented system of psychiatry I have ever worked in. I've also worked in Australia, where Mohan is now. And I have to say Australia also had, at least where I was in Sydney for about a year, a very, very community focused approach. And what do I mean by that? It had community teams that often supported uh, people in their own homes. The team typically comprised was led by a social worker or a nurse. It wasn't a psychiatrist. Uh, they tended to be from that local community, not actually unlike, you know, the idea of an ASHA, but of course, in a much more professionalized way. Um, there were also a range of other kinds of facilities. You know, I don't, I've heard, not heard the word quarter home, but, you know, halfway homes, uh, you know, daycare centers, residential homes and in the, no, and the residential classic facility used to be um, actually in the community. It would be group living. So it would not be like a, a walled institution. It would be like a house with six to eight individuals, each with their own rooms, and there'd be a care caretaker who would come in, etc. You know, so they had a very large range of services. And most important to say, um, it was all free. Uh, you know, I mean, everything was free, including stay, in, including the, the, the cost of living in that group home was free. Uh, it was entirely funded through taxes. Uh, and so I do think um, European countries and maybe Australia uh, and, and New Zealand have evolved, in my mind, perhaps the best mental health care system. There's still a lot of work they can do, but it is certainly the kind of goal that I would see that we should be emulating in India, certainly not the American system. That is absolutely not the system to be trying to copy uh, in India. Okay, sir, can we have your email ID? If sure, you, if that's the, organi okay. the organizer, I'll put it in, I'll put it inside the, the chat box. Yeah, thank you. Just, thank just, you so just much. A just a brief brief comment, uh, Dr. Patel, from from uh, to today's UK is I agree it was like that a few years back, but it's really concerning how much funding has been taken away from all these things in recent years. It's really really worrying that that like you're saying, um, it's not a priority and one of the first things to get cut. Oh, well, thank you. So are there any more questions for Vikram? Okay, if there are none, then thanks again, Vikram. And uh, let me hand it over back to MPA. Thank you so much, Dr. Tara, Dr. Vikram. It was an absolutely wonderful uh, oration. May I call upon uh, our uh, president, Dr. Joseph George, for a quick virtual presentation um, of a small uh, token of appreciation from us. Uh, Dr. Patel, we will be sharing this with you, but we would like to sort of uh, do the honors virtually because that's where we are right now. Uh, sir, Dr. Joseph, I'm just sharing the screen. And uh, okay. may I request you to say a few words, please? Yeah. yeah. All right. Um... I'm sure all of you will agree with me that it was a very enriching evening for all of us. Uh, the right to mental health and uh, some in-depth discussions on how the, the community and other factors play a major role in mental, maintaining mental health as well as looking at the illness part. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Vikram Patel for being with us. This is the plaque that we have made and it will be sent to you in, in, your, in your mail address. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the honor. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. Uh, and all the very best to the MPA for its next 50 years. I hope I won't be around at your centenary for sure. But nevertheless, I hope very uh, all good success to your mission. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I wonderful, call upon thank you for now. a wonderful uh, presentation, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit. I really appreciate that. May I request Dr. Mohan Isaac to please surrender the official vote of thanks. Mohan, sir, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Rohini says this is the official uh, vote of thanks. Uh, uh, I want to say that uh, there are very few people from whom I get a reply within few hours after sending a mail. One of them is Vikram Patel. You send a mail to him, day or night, whichever part of the world you are in, Australia, India, wherever you are. He is an extremely busy person. He also travels extensively. But one thing is sure, I get a reply, whether it is within four hours or six hours, that, that is the only confusion. But you would get a reply very soon. That's exactly what happened once the, it, it was in one of the committees, MPA had decided that Vikram will be invited. And uh, uh, Ajit and Rohini, who are in charge of organizing these uh, meetings, told me, uh, you, you have to get in touch with Vikram and get a date, etc. So I asked them when approximately, etc. I told them he, he may not be in India. He will be... Uh, the only problem I had was that usually these lectures are 4 p.m. We can make it 6 p.m. I told Ajit that would be a terrible time in the, uh, Boston... Uh, or wherever Vikram would be, etc. But anyway, I wrote to him. And as I mentioned, within a few hours, the reply came, yes, I'll be very happy to. There will not be any problem about the timing. I will be in India at that time. When is the date, etc. So uh, that is how Vikram is. In spite of his uh, extremely busy schedule, he always replies. I told you, very rarely do I get this kind of a response. There are only a handful of people where I get a response like this. Thank you very much, Vikram, for agreeing to give this second joint ceremony oration. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I didn't know that you would be in India for a, this much of a period. I didn't want to burden you with a visit to Bangalore. Now, looking back, when I saw your uh, last mail, I understand that you are in India from uh, December or so. We could have had, uh, uh, you know, actual meeting at our MPA auditorium. You could have seen MPA. You could have seen our residents and all that. Anyway, that's all right, but thank you very much. Now, Tara, uh, of course, uh, uh, has always been a friend of uh, Medical Partial Association. Uh, she told us already that the organization that she is the vice chair of and she was a director for a long time is only 10 years younger than us. In fact, next Saturday, you will uh, have their 40th uh, uh, anniversary celebration where Vikram, you will, all of you will have an occasion to listen to Vikram again, along with Tara and many others. So thank you, Tara, for uh, kindly agreeing to chair the session. Uh, of course, when we invited you, we had uh, no hesitation that you will agree, unless, uh, you know, you are uh, not well or something. Otherwise, we were, because I must also tell you for the audience who do not know, it was Vikram and Tara who wrote a very seminal paper on the role of non-government organizations in mental health care in India, in the published in the Journal of Psychiatry, and also a book wherein, of course, there are chapters by various non-government organizations, including a chapter, I think, written by Lata and Ellen North about Medical Partial Association. That book was one of the earliest books, not only in India, but about the role uh, of non-governmental organizations in mental health, which is now widely appreciated in most other countries. They know that certain kinds of tasks cannot be done by public sector or governmental organizations. They can be non-governmental organizations are innovators, et cetera, et cetera. So Tara, we knew you would kindly agree, but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to uh, especially thank, but before that, I want to respond to uh, the last part of the discussion, uh, Vikram said that when he was trained in training in UK, things were much better. America is not the model. But Lorna, who is a very good friend of ours, 
who lives in UK but comes now and then to Medco Bachelor Association. Whenever she comes to Bangalore, she spends a lot of time with MPA. She is one of our donors. She is one of our good friends. She said that uh, Vikram, that is fine. That was three, four years ago. Now things are bad. There's no not enough funding. Just to validate what uh, uh, Lorna said, just about three weeks or uh, four weeks ago, I read in The Economist an editorial. The editorial is titled Britain's Mental Health Mess. It's a one and a half page editorial followed by a three or four page article. Very true. Uh, in a way, some of the things uh, which is occurring in Britain is occurring in Australia, Canada, etc. I'm not going to the details of that. But the byline for that Britain's mental health mess. This is also validating something which Nirmala Srinivasan uh, mentioned earlier. She mentioned about the vulgarization of mental health. Uh, like Vikram, I am also hearing that word first time. Byline of these editorials, too many mild mental health cases are being medicalized and too many severe cases ignored. I think this is what is occurring in many, many parts of the world, including the United States. Severe mental illness, people with uh, schizophrenia, bipolar uh, 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 disorders, paranoia, etc., are ignored completely. And people with, uh, you know, I mean, the former term for this uh, medicalization of mild cases, the worried, etc. Anyway, I just wanted to validate what uh, Lorna was saying. I'm not validating. The Economist, which is a very prestigious, one of the oldest journals in the world, had written about it. I want to Especially thank uh, Amita. Of course, this is Joyce Romani's uh, uh, the uh, oration in uh, uh, Joyce Romani's name. Thank you, Amita. Uh, I saw your husband also behind you uh, some time back. Maybe he was sitting somewhere and listening to the oration. Doesn't matter. Thank you very much. We, of course, miss uh, Naveen very much. Uh, in connection with this, uh, one of the thoughts which I had about Joyce uh, I must mention, this is her second uh, oration in her name. Uh, those days, as well as these days, many women leaders who have done something, who have achieved something, they are extremely proud of what they do. And then when they have to move, uh, I, I find even now, they find it very, very difficult to move out and give up, etc., etc. What I find from the life story of Paul Siromani and uh, Dr. Joyce Siromani is that she was above all a very devout wife. She, when Paul was recruited by the Church of South India to come to Bangalore from Allahabad, she was already in clinical work, working as a doctor. She gave up all that. She came to Bangalore and did something which was in line with what he was doing at the St. Mark's Church. And many years later, in the early 80s, Paul moved to Calcutta. Uh, Joyce didn't say, oh, Medical Partial Association, I am the secretary, this, that, what will happen to Medical Partial Association, etc. She very gracefully left everything, got other people to run the place, went to Calcutta, and that was a blessing in disguise because she started the very program. And then, of course, when they retired, they came to... So she was not one of those who, you know, was very extremely proud of her achievements but much more proud of being with the husband, moving around, etc. I just thought I would mention this. Thank you very much, Amita, for attending the meeting. Juma from Paripurnata. Uh, I just would like to mention, because Paripurnata is another organization which was founded by Joyce Romani. Actually, she has written about how, you know, the uh, Sheila Bar Savers of the Union of India, the mentally ill women in the Calcutta jails, West Bengal jails came up. And she was instrumental in uh, starting it. And as always, she was very, very, uh, you know, uh, successful in getting the land from the governor of uh, uh, West Bengal. And now there is a three or four story building, which is the Paripurnata organization in Calcutta. Uh, so thank you, Juma. You represent Paripurnata and we like seeing you for our. I would I, like to also thank very senior psychiatrists, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, Dr. Kalyan Sundaram, Dr. Murli, who was formerly the president of the World Association of Psychosocial Rehabilitation, all of them for participating in Medical Partial Association program. Nirmala is a very important person. She founded the 
Fasimi. She represents a large number of family members, not only in Bangalore, but in Delhi. In, the, in fact, uh, I have not yet replied. I have a mail from somebody in Delhi saying Nirmala has asked her to contact me. Nirmala, I will certainly, when I get time, uh, I will reply to her. Unfortunately, I don't have the skills and abilities of Vikram to reply within a few hours. So thank you, Nirmala, for uh, uh, attending the meeting because when you attend, I know that some of these will go to many other meetings of family organization. I also want to note uh, in our midst, our past uh, office bearers, I'm referring to Ramola, who never misses. She is a past uh, secretary of the Medical Partial Association during uh, turbulent years. But she, she says that she has passed a certain age and she doesn't want to come, but she always is virtually present for all the meetings. Thank you for your encouragement. And I want to thank all other people who attended the uh, program. And uh, don't want to say anything about the lecture because Vikram is an eminent speaker. He spoke about, uh, you know, three important things about the primary prevention of mental illness, which uh, one of the participants uh, reworded it. And uh, she said uh, that is uh, working in her son's case, etc. And also the long, long years of... Uh, you know, the violation of human rights, which I think is even now occurring in many, many places. And also the solution to all this, that is the using available community resources to deal with this. We don't wait for the huge resources to be available, make use of the existing resources. So thank you very much, uh, Vikram, once again, for a very lucid, very clear lecture. And uh, I want to also finally thank all the MPA staff and uh, Rohini, of course, does all the uh, dirty work of writing mails, getting consents and all that, fixing updates, etc., etc. And last but not least, Mr. Ganeshan of uh, Micro, who has been supporting us for not only the Joyce Romani oration, but also our Golden Jubilee uh, orations. Now, for the lot of people have asked, with the, uh, I saw in the chat box somebody saying, I'm in a train traveling with the uh, lecture and the PowerPoint be available. All the lectures, public lectures of Medical Partial Association would be uploaded after a little bit of editing within three, four days uh, in the Medical Partial Association YouTube channel. Uh, in fact, you can, if you want to see Dr. Norman Sartori's lecture, which was given in December 2020, it is still available. Vikram's lecture will also be there. Tara's lecture, which was a Golden Jubilee lecture, and we also keep monitoring how many people are watching this, are the numbers increasing. And we do, the reason, Ajit mentioned that we continued after 12 years of, 12 lectures of Golden Jubilee because many people said it is useful and we are watching it. So this lecture also will be available. Uh, so anybody can go back and listen to the lecture again. Back to you, Ron. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would like to end today's oration with a small little it's not a prayer, it's a quote, it's something that is absolutely um, something I follow and I wish for every day. If I can do some good today, if I can serve along life's way, if I can something helpful say, Lord, show me how. If I can right a human wrong, if I can help to make one strong, if I can cheer with smile or song, Lord, show me how. If I can aid one in distress, if I can make a burden less, if I can spread more happiness, Lord, show me how. And this is what our founder has done. And this is what we all hope to continue uh, for as long as we can. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful year ahead and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.